Welcome to Your Daily Detroit for Thursday, December 12th, 2019. I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafson. On today's show, I round up some things you should know around town. Then I have some very special weekend plans as Detroit will be hopping. Then me and Sven talk about the early impact of recreational marijuana on Michigan. The early numbers are pretty interesting. Before we do that, thanks to our members. You are who make this show possible, and you can join us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. And thank you. A decommissioned power plant on Detroit's east side will be demolished Friday morning. Connors Creek famously had the seven sisters and two brothers. Towering smokestacks over the Detroit River you could see for miles. The seven sisters came down in 1996, and, and I remember seeing that. And the two brothers will be what are coming down on Friday. The coal plant first fired up in 1915 and was eventually converted to natural gas before being shut down in 1988. It could power 400,000 homes, and it was kind of a relic of Detroit's boom times. Today, the city of Detroit has less than 260,000 households across all 139 square miles. The land will become part of that new giant Fiat Chrysler facility under construction. A quick little story as I'm rather excited about it. The National Independent Soccer Association, or NISA, has approved the Detroit City FC to join their organization. They joined Chattanooga FC, Michigan Stars FC, and Oakland Roots SC in joining a NISA roster of professional clubs. They're going to begin league play in spring of 2020. Also of note, the Michigan Stars are based not too far away up in Pontiac. Local chain Bobcat Bonnie's continues to be on a roll with locations in Detroit's Corktown, Ferndale, Ypsilanti, and now they're opening in Partridge Creek in a former Max and Irma's. Partridge Creek Mall is on Hall Road in Clinton Township. It's about a 45-minute drive from downtown Detroit. It'll be open in February of 2020. All right, so I know it's Thursday, but here's the deal. You need to be thinking about the weekend, and the city is the place to be. So let's dive in. First up, we're actually doing a pop-up happy hour at Hammer and Nail in Midtown from 4 to 7 p.m. on Friday evening. We were going to record some segments and realize that, well, we're going to be on a bar and it's going to be on a Friday evening at happy hour. So we better invite everyone else to come and let's have a drink. Let's uh, stop on by and uh, say hi. There's a Facebook event we'll link to in the show notes or you can find it on our Facebook page. Of course, our little event is not all to be done. Later in the night, starting at like 8 in the evening or so, the awesome Detroit Party Marching Band will be celebrating their 10th anniversary. If you've never been honored by the marching band coming through your bar at a random time, it is a treat and a little bit of Motor City magic. So they're celebrating. There's no cover, but spend money there. It'll be at Sanctuary Detroit in Hamtramck, specifically 2932 Kniff Street. Now on to Saturday. Corktown Aglow is going to deck the halls of one of Detroit's oldest neighborhoods. Look, I have been seeing pics online of the tree uh, over by Folk that's like on Trumbull, just south of Michigan. And look, it it just looks great. Corktown Aglow runs from noon to 10 p.m. Saturday, and there will be everything from carriage rides to free hot cocoa. The tree lights at 6 p.m., and there are businesses that are going to be open all over Corktown. This is a great opportunity to shop local, get a few things off your Christmas list. I will drop a link to corktownaglow.com in the show notes. And then finally, if you are still out and about at 10 p.m. on Saturday, it's time to dance. And I can think of no better place to shake it and honor the musical traditions of Detroit than the Motor City Soul Club at the Marble Bar. The December Soul Stomp, as always, will be all vinyl and, of course, all soul. And like everything on this list, no cover, just good times. The Marble Bar is at 1501 Holden Street, tucked a couple blocks behind the Motown Museum. So, Jer, a story that caught my attention uh, has to do with the advent of legal recreational marijuana here in Michigan, right? So the, uh, the first stores... Uh, started operation on December 1st. That was a week ago Sunday. And in the first eight days, they tallied up 1.63 million almost in sales. So that's from five different retail shops, right? But uh, it's important to remember that not all five were open for all eight days. Well, and it's also just five retail shops. Only five deep retail shops in the entire state. Three of them were in Ann Arbor. Those were the only three that were open that have been open all three days, apparently, right? Okay. Uh, there was another one down in Morency, which is a tiny town on the Ohio State 
line uh, that I think was open only a fraction of the time. And then an, another store up in Everett, which is kind of in north central Michigan that uh, started business on Friday. So in reality, no Metro Detroit, no Grand Rapids? Not yet, no. Okay. And, and in Detroit has has basically opted out of recreational marijuana until at least the end of January because they want to put uh, together, they want to have time to put together a new ordinance uh, regulating sales. Anyway, I did some of the math, and uh, that's a little more than three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in revenue per store, which is pretty good haul for a retail store, right? Nowadays, in the era of Amazon dominance and you know the decline of brick and mortar retail, so you know, which all goes to show you that Michigan's marijuana law is going to save brick and mortar retail, right? <laughs> uh, I kid, I kid. Uh, but interesting stuff. The other thing that that is interesting about this, I mean, in addition to just kind of the eye-popping figures, is the tax revenue that it's going to generate, right? So in the first eight days, from again, from five stores, with much of the state still unserved, that has led to collection of about $163,000 in the excise tax and another $107,000, we'll call it $108,000 from the 6% sales tax. Now, I've seen a lot of, you know, you continue to see people thinking that, like, this is going to help fix our roads, right? Which it is. But it's a drop in the bucket, let's be honest. So uh, recreational marijuana is going to be taxed in two ways. There's a 10% excise tax. That's going to be split three ways between municipalities that allow recreational marijuana, not all of them, but the ones that do allow it. It's going to go to the school aid fund. And it's going to go to fixing the roads, which is good. Then there's the 6% sales tax, which is also split three ways. School aid fund, revenue sharing to cities, villages, townships, et cetera, counties, and the state's general fund. So uh, this is going to help fix state roads, but it's certainly not going to be a panacea. The other thing I would point out is that the House Fiscal Agency, which is you know the function of the state government, they've estimated that uh, once the state's recreational marijuana Industry is fully established sometime after 2020, so a year from now still, like at least. They estimate that recreational marijuana will be a nearly $950 million industry, almost a billion dollar industry. And it's going to bring in almost $95 million from the 10% excise tax and another $57 million per year from the 6% sales tax. Split a bunch of different ways, though. Split a bunch of different ways. So what's your sense? Do you think that those estimates are going to be conservative? Do you think that we're going to beat them? Do you think this like great performance is because of the pent up demand? What do you think about all that? That's a good question. And I mean, I'm not sure that there's enough precedent necessarily to be able to say. I mean, Michigan, I think, is the 10th state, if I'm not mistaken, to fully legalize recreational marijuana. You know, over the Thanksgiving break, I um, saw a friend of mine who lives in San Francisco. He's a Detroit native, you know, who lives out there in the Bay Area now. And California has fully recreational marijuana. Um, I think it was the first state, if I'm not mistaken, to legalize uh, medical marijuana. But anyway, he said that people who still buy through legal means tend to still favor going through the medical uh, route because it's much cheaper than going to a recreational marijuana dispensary. And I said, why is that? Is it because it's taxed lower? And he wasn't sure, but that seems to be likely. And I, have, I haven't really had a chance to like look into that. But recreational marijuana is going to be taxed at a 16% rate here. So that's a pretty high tax for this product. So that could be a factor. Certainly, that's going to be an argument for kind of preserving inadvertently the black market for for weed, frankly. I mean, people I mean are gonna... that's what I've been hearing is that there's still a strong black market because the cost of, of course. marijuana is so high right now. Right, because and the, con- the supply is so constrained. Right, because in order to sell it, you have to assure that you're testing the marijuana. That adds costs, obviously, into the pipeline. Um, you're going to pay for your overhead, for the lighting, for the rent, for the you know, everything that goes into like running a storefront. And, you know, then you have to pass on the 16% tax to customers. So, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to kill off illegal black market sales of marijuana per se. So it remains to be seen, but like anecdotally, I mean, the thing I kind of learned, I feel like I've learned since I've got older, Jer, is that like everybody smokes weed. (laughs) I mean, except you and I. Well, we would never do such a thing. <laughs> Shout out to the almond windmill cookies we're eating right now. Yeah, yeah, from uh, from Little Dutch Maid. 
You know what? Available at your finest. Family dollar. Yeah. I was so surprised. So that's the thing about the family dollar. Sometimes it's a great hit. Sometimes it's a total miss. This was one that I'm going to go back for because these cookies definitely, they're very munchy. Back to the new, you know, recreational marijuana market. I mean, it's going to be fascinating to to see it. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with like a fellow parent, my wife and I did recently, who talked about how her son basically found, you know, her stash or whatever. And she's got a medical marijuana license and she had to like calmly explain to him that like, you know, I have a legitimate reason for using this. And, you know, it's similar to alcohol, but in many ways it's less harmful than alcohol. And, you know, it it, it all kind of made me realize that, like, there are going to be huge cultural stigmas to kind of overcome as we move forward with this. I mean, you know, for anybody who's got who's a parent or just is accustomed to, like, living in this world where, like, you had to be very secretive about this, it's a huge cultural change. But isn't America in general a country about vices that we all participate in and then shame publicly. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we do here. Yeah, good point. One thing, though, that to me from like the going back to like the more budgetary side of things, I think there are just I think there's just going to be so much disappointment when the roads aren't fixed because of the pot for potholes. Like that seems so catchy. And it's something that like spreads so well on the Internet as a meme. Right. That this is the way that things go. But like. When you get into the nitty gritty of it, and I think that's just in in general, like there's lots of ideas that sound good in like a, a meme, but when it comes to actually making it happen, there's a pretty big gap between that and reality. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know it's going to. I mean, generate... even if you took all the money, even if you took all the money and put it towards roads. Right. True. I mean, it, it's going to help contribute some money toward fixing roads more than we had before, so that's a good thing. But it's not a panacea. It's not going. It's not an end all be all. Well, I don't think people realize the like the millions of dollars that it takes per lane mile. Oh, it's to, huge. to fix roads, like roads are ridiculous. Like they're very, very expensive. Yeah, our friend uh, Dave Giffords had a pretty brilliant tweet. The Shout other out, day. Dave. Yeah, hi, Dave. That showed uh, the comparison of like, uh, I think it was like 1.5 uh, million. I don't remember the figure. I'm probably botching it offhand, but he'll tweet us. What it, the com- cost comparison to fix, you know, a small length of road to like resurface, uh, fix the potholes, so forth of highway versus what the equivalent amount would cost in terms of like public transit improvements. And it was mm-hmm. just, it was staggering. Well, and especially if you think about so many places, especially in this region, where we have roads that serve so few people, but they're just like destroyed to the to the end by heavy trucks, by just a whole whole bunch of things. It seems like we're just not haven't been able to catch up with it. And, you know, there's there's more budget dealing and budget talks, but I feel like we're not moving anywhere really with the whole roads debate. I don't think that's a it feels like that's kind of I hate to say this. People say that it's important, but I feel like the actions show us that it's not. But, you know, Sven, back back to the marijuana thing, like, I think it's a really interesting story. And I'm really glad that uh, you're spending some time to, like, do coverage on this over the last year, year and a half. And I'm assuming you're going to do more. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said, lots of people like to blaze up. One could say that they're high on it. And we're done for today. Thanks all for pushing us up the Epic Podcast charts. At one point last weekend, we literally passed daily shows from CNN, Politico, and The Daily Beast. That's absolutely insane. Thank you. And you know how that happens? It's when you tell a friend about Daily Detroit. Send them to dailydetroit.com or text them a link to Apple Podcasts, Carrier, Pigeon, Cuneiform, Scribe, Tablets, whatever it takes. Also, we're working on a new call-in feature for folks to leave feedback Plus, one more trick up our sleeve, because, of course, we couldn't just do a voicemail. I mean, we're talking about Engineer Randy here. He's always up to something. I'm looking forward to showing it to you very soon. For Sven Gustafson, I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit.